Hi, I'm Dr. Matt Linnea. I direct the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado, and I am on the sort of core faculty of the Mountain Plains Regional Disaster Response System. And I'm gonna uh, share my screen here so that I can um, speak with you today in the first of three of these planned sessions, which are around navigating ethical challenges in public health emergencies. Um, these are, uh, oh, this is the standard uh, disclaimer slide uh, about the Mountain Plains Regional Disaster Response System and these just-in-time learning uh, programs that are funded by ASPR, um, and I don't have uh, any other um, disclosures um, to make. So uh, I don't have any financial disclosures either. So I wanna start with a broad question here, which is um, if in the context of a public health emergency, you had to make trade-offs between a few different potential things that you really value, how would you rate them? Uh, do you think you know, your highest priority is uh, saving the most lives? Do you think your highest priority is making sure you're safe and your family? Do you think your highest priority is uh, that we cannot violate personal liberties, constitutional rights? What about the, the value of economic stability or equity and ensuring the well-being of the most vulnerable during a disaster? Because the reality, of course, is that sometimes we do end up um, having to make these trade-offs. And that's what we're going to be talking about over the next uh, couple of sessions, is how do we think about the various values that have to be weighed in public health um, ethics? So I'm going to today give a little bit of background, and then I'm going to dive into part one, which is on the responsibility to continue providing care um, in the context of personal danger the responsibility to respond or duty to treat. Um, I'm gonna use some historical examples to talk about these uh, general issues and the duty to treat. I'm gonna say a couple words about COVID along the way, but mostly my examples are not about COVID. They're um, earlier uh, things. And the core point that I wanna make today is that there are multiple values that can and are sometimes in tension. Values like equity, and privacy and proportionality and liberty and justice and transparency. Sometimes you cannot optimize all of those at once and you end up needing to really think about what are your priorities and the priorities of the public health system. So uh, let me start with this uh, historical example. Um, this is an illness that uh, is a bacterial illness. It tends to, the bacteria tend to accumulate in the fingers and the hands and the nose and the ears, places in your body that are cool, uh, cooler than the central body. Uh, people often end up losing uh, fingers. They will often end up with a lot of the bacteria building up under the face. It causes what's called a leonine or lion-like face. And uh, the people with these illnesses tended to be segregated off and uh, stigmatized very heavily. They were put into colonies. This is the one at Kalapapa on the island of uh, Molokai in Hawaii. Um, and of course, this is uh, what is called Hansen's disease or leprosy. Um, Hansen's disease tends to affect the poorest communities by far the hardest. Um, it's not that others can't catch it, but if you live in crowded conditions and you are malnourished, you are far more likely to catch Hansen's disease. And so I think this is an excellent example of a common phenomenon across multiple conditions, which is it hits the poorest the hardest. Uh, we saw this across the world in the COVID-19 case reported fatality rates. Uh, we also saw some of these dynamics where, for example, the first people to catch COVID in Mexico caught it when they were skiing in Vail. So they were wealthy people from Mexico City who caught the virus, brought it back to Mexico City, and of course it then took off in, and dramatically affected the poorer communities in Mexico City the most. This is not just true in the U.S. and Mexico. These are all-cause mortality data on uh, China, from uh, India. And these are various sort of social determinants of health, like do you have electricity in your home? And just across the board, um, you can see that, you know, and I know there's too much detail here, but I'll just 
tell you, you'll, you can get these slides and um, across the board, uh, if you have poorer social determinants of health, you have higher rates of mortality from COVID. Okay, here's the second um, main point I wanna make using an historical example. This is an illness uh, that historically was called the great pox, uh, distinguishing it from smallpox. This was the great pox because it caused large crusted pustules, apparently very painful. Um, it would often progress to uh, including the soles of the feet and the palms of the hands. And so this usually gives it away for clinicians. This is syphilis. Syphilis uh, was known as um, the great pox and blame for the great pox was spread around. Uh, and this is uh, another common phenomenon, right? When uh, when a disease comes along, we want to try to blame it on someone else. So Italians called uh, syphilis the Spanish pox. Um, the French called it the Italian pox or Neapolitan pox. English called it the French pox. Poles called it the German pox. Russians called it the Polish pox. Uh, again, these people were uh, heavily stigmatized. Syphilis patients in Scotland were isolated on an island. Some of them, uh, in some circumstances, they had to wear a cowbell so that people would know they were coming. Uh, and in the U.S., there was a medical, I put that in scare quotes, controversy over whether to treat patients with syphilis because uh, the idea was you didn't want uh, people to uh, be treated if God had given them this disease, that that was essentially, um, that was essentially uh, preventing God's work from being done. Okay, last one here. What is this illness? Uh, this is uh, an illness that is also a bacterial illness. It causes uh, big swollen lymph nodes uh, called buboes. Uh, if it progresses to include to uh, become systemic, it is extremely high in its mortality rate. It causes uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation, so fingers and toes can turn black and fall off, which is why it was also called the black death. So the Black Death, Yersinia pestis or plague, killed about 25 million Europeans uh, in just a few years' time, about 25% of the total population, so far more deadly um, than anything we have seen uh, in recent years. Boccaccio wrote that it progressed very rapidly. People would be uh, eating a normal breakfast in the morning and then eating with their ancestors in the next world by that night. Uh, there were many cities, including uh, this one uh, pictured here, which is Dubrovnik, in which 800 people were dying per day at some time. So enormous levels of mortality. And the term quarantine comes from uh, the 40 days, quaranta giorni, that ships had to be uh, roped up at harbor before they could be unloaded. And I put this up because infectious threats are dangerous to the people who take care of people with that infection. This, and there are other types of dangers in disaster response, obviously, but infectious threats are really where this comes to a head. Um, and of course, when you are threatened, you take self-protective action. So many of you have seen this uh, image of the doctor's robe. Um, the doctor's robe was uh, a, a muslin typically dipped in wax, so it was very hot and heavy, but it hung all the way to the ground. Um, and the idea was that you would then wear this mask and the mask would be filled with something in that beak that would be like uh, rags, maybe dipped in cat urine or some kind of herbs. The idea being you wanted to keep the ethers, the bad ethers, from getting into you. Interestingly, uh, one priest in Italy said he hated this thing because it was hot and uncomfortable, and he thought it was useless against the plague, although it did protect from fleas because fleas couldn't nest in it, which, of course, means it was effective <laughs> against the plague, which is transmitted by the bite of fleas. Um, so let's get into this, you know, who stays and continues caring for patients? Because throughout history, um, in essentially every major uh, disaster, some doctors and nurses and EMTs and others have fled the area um, when a disaster struck or when an infectious disease uh, epidemic came along. For many doctors um, in the time of the plagues, their advice to the rich was the same advice they took themselves, which was quito, longe, tarde, go fast, Go far and don't come back too soon. 
as a result, um, there were towns that had to hire plague doctors. But interestingly, there were a series of books written by doctors who stayed. And they describe the motivations that caused them to stay. They had religious motivations. Uh, they had motivations that were essentially, look, my family lives here. Where else am I going to go? Um, and there were those who were certainly motivated by money or by the idea of God's favor or salvation. You know, even if I die doing this, at least I will go to heaven, that kind of thinking as well. Um, it is still the case, of course, that uh, that uh, disasters can be quite dangerous to uh, responders. Um, in the Tokyo sarin gas attacks, uh, a third of the people who were there responding ended up becoming poisoned themselves with sarin gas. In the World Trade Center attacks, uh, you all probably remember that multiple ambulances and their crews were crushed um, in the collapse of the towers. Um, Health professionals have always been the primary victims of SARS uh, when that came out in 2003. Um, and health professionals are common victims of other diseases like viral hemorrhagic fevers and occupational uh, infections like TB and influenza continue to be higher among healthcare workers. Um, even with uh, influenza vaccination, we are more exposed um, than other people are. And of course, during COVID, we saw very high rates of uh, COVID contraction by people taking care of patients, especially early in the pandemic before uh, when there were shortages of PPE and before, uh, there were, um, before there were vaccines. So we saw a series of studies looking at this and uh, you know, every one of them shows the same thing that it is dangerous sometimes to be a healthcare worker. Um, this is Matthew Luquia, who died of Ebola hemorrhagic fever uh, in the uh, Uganda outbreak in 2000. And I will say he, uh, you know, he is heroic about this. Um, he says it's our mission to save lives and we do our work. Uh, we do our best not to get uh, infected, but we do our work. And you notice, by the way, um, his, you know, personal protective equipment is not that great. Um, this is uh, Carlo Urbani. He was uh, the first to describe SARS uh, and died of SARS. And of course, many of you will recognize Li Wenliang, who was one of the first to describe COVID and died of COVID. So this is an ongoing um, issue that when we respond to disasters, when we respond uh, to infectious outbreaks, it is uh, it is a possibility that that is uh, more dangerous than we at first realize, or, or maybe it's as dangerous as we know. Um, the history of the duty to treat among health professionals is interesting because um, it is not found in the Hippocratic corpus. Uh, so there's nothing in the Hippocratic oath that says you have to keep taking care of someone even if they pose a danger to you. Um, it's also not found in any of the early codes of ethics, um, such as Percival's medical ethics or the Royal College of Physicians code, uh, which was written during a plague. But again, back in that time, morality in medicine was really based on individual morality. It was your character. It was your religious duty. It was your uh, common morality uh, that everyone had. But there was no sort of morality of being a doctor or being a nurse. Um, the first actual uh, written articulation of a profession-wide duty to treat was in the uh, first edition of the AMA's Code of Medical Ethics in 1847, which said when uh, when a plague comes along, it's a physician's duty to face the danger, continue their labors for the alleviation of suffering, even at the jeopardy of their own lives. This actually um, was expanded in 1912 to say, and uh, without regard to remuneration. So the AMA here is saying morality of doctors is not an individual choice. It's something we all take on together. It's a profession-wide promise that we will continue to work even in the face of danger. This was a pretty effective um, promise, I will say. If you look back to you know the 1920s and 30s, being a doctor was quite uh, risky. Uh, being a nurse was quite risky. Um, you were guaranteed, essentially, that you were going to get uh, tuberculosis if you entered the medical field. It was just part of the. It was part of the deal, um, because of course there was not really a way to avoid it back then. Um, 
But that uh, that sense of professional duty really waned as uh, infectious epidemics tended to wane over the course of the 20th century. Um, and in fact, that clause of the AMA Code of Ethics was removed from the Code of Ethics um, in the 1980s when, uh, when you know, famously uh, people were saying the era of infectious diseases has come to an end uh, right before, of course, the HIV pandemic hit us. Um, and so it was not until 2004 in the wake of 9-11 and the Ebola outbreak uh, of the of the early 2000s that we at the AMA decided to really reiterate this idea that we should not have to rely on individual heroism, that physicians have a professional commitment to ensure adequate availability of care and that there is a responsibility to continue caring for patients in the face of personal risk. And that that responsibility is based on the notion that we have uh, moral obligations that arise from our training that we have unique capabilities, we are uniquely proximate to those who need us, um, and that there are others who uh, others are not able to do this because we have uh, uh, we have a lock on the skills and uh, and resources of the medical care system, right? So when you take that lock uh, on resources and training, uh, you get some uh, responsibilities that come with that. Uh, in terms of legally. With HIV, for example, um, it is illegal to refuse to take care of a patient just because they have HIV infection. So even if you think they might pose a danger to you, uh, if you are otherwise trained to take care of them, uh, you cannot discriminate against patients. Uh, this was the famous Supreme Court case of Bragdon v. Abbott. And there's this notion that all of this is encompassed by the idea of a social contract, that we get benefits uh, of our professional status and that that comes with reciprocal obligations. That, of course, leads to this question of um, if we are a group of people who share and profess a, a set of competencies and obligations and rights and responsibilities, to what extent do we have to live up to those obligations, even if we as individuals would rather not, right? Do we give up our individual liberties when we sign on to our profession? And this gets to the question I started with, and it's how I'll end, which is there's obviously a spectrum here from a duty to continue working in the face of some risk to acting as a hero and continuing to you know, care for uh, a patient, even though it's extremely risky, to martyrdom where you know for a fact you're going to die, but you're still hoping to save the patient, to frank stupidity, right? Uh, fire professionals are not required to rush into a burning building that is actively collapsing. They're, you know, you are going to die and you're not gonna save anyone else. So that's not even martyrdom. Um, so what are the limits? Where does duty turn into heroism? Where does heroism turn into martyrdom? Where does martyrdom turn into stupidity? These are all gray questions. And the bottom line, I think, is that we don't have a universal standard that is clear and concise, which means in each generation, we have to decide individually and as a group how important is this for our profession? What do we expect of each other? What should the public expect of us? And of course, I'll hasten to add that our sense of professional duty is bolstered dramatically when society recognizes reciprocal obligations. So we saw, you know, essentially everywhere uh, in the world, health professionals continue to show up and take care of patients with COVID even when they were lacking uh, in effective PPE sometimes. So we obviously hold this as a deep value and our patients expected of, it, uh, expected of us. We also have a responsibility then as a society to figure out how to best support people who are taking on this, uh, this excessive risk. So let me just complete this by saying these are the key points. Risks are real in responding to disaster. Um, and historically, not all health professionals have continued to work, but with contemporary codes of ethics and understandings of professions as holding a social contract, um, there has been a strengthening of that, which we saw during COVID. Still, however, there is a spectrum from heroism, you know, from duty to heroism to martyrdom and so on. And we as a community get to decide in every generation where we draw the line on the duty to treat. 
for those who want to read more about this, there is a lot more written about uh, the duty to treat and um, and the and where different people think that line ought to be drawn. Um, I'll, I'll suffice to say it is a conversation that I think has to be ongoing forever. Uh, there is not a single clear answer to this that that will rest in place for all time. Each generation needs to have this conversation. Um, and I'll invite you, if you would like, uh, to um, to go ahead and send me an email if you want to hear more about that. Uh, in the meantime, I hope to see you again uh, in part two of this, where we will uh, talk about restrictions on liberties and the ethical challenges that that uh, set of dynamics can pose. <laughs>